Welcome to IAC's Good Friday service. We are so glad to have you here tonight. I want to encourage those who got a worship packet to go ahead and have out the wood um, and the nails and, and the paper um, for tonight. Using that is optional this evening, um, but we want you to have that. One special note about the wood. Um, each year, um, we have the tradition here at IAC of nailing sins into um, the cross. And one of the crosses that we have used in years past, this year, um, our, our sexton Joel Weathers actually broke into many different pieces. So the cross that we have used has been placed in those worship packets for you to have and to keep. It is a sign of the splintered, fractured body of Christ on this night, not only the physical body of Christ on the cross, but also our church body. We invite you to keep those pieces of wood until the day that we gather back in this sanctuary again as a sign of the ache and the longing of being separated from one another. We also encourage you to darken your rooms as uh, where you are as much as possible. We know that's uh, more or less possible depending on where you are, uh, but we encourage you to do that as much as is possible as we move through the service tonight. We're going to have just a few moments for uh, Pastor Christy to talk to the kids, and then we will begin. Hi, kids. I'm so glad that you are here to join with us today. Today's service is really different, and so in your houses it might be dark, and we talked on our Zoom about what happened a long time ago, and we brought these big nails, and we talked about the crown of thorns that went on Jesus's head, and we also talked about all of that happened because of how much you are loved. And so during this service, you have sheets to fill out if you want to during the sermon, but if you want to just draw a cross, or color a picture of what the Holy Spirit is doing inside, showing you and teaching you, I encourage you guys to do that. Can I pray for you kids before we begin? Come on close to the camera so I can see your faces. Would you pray with me? Jesus, I pray that tonight would be a powerful night for these kids to know how deep your love is. God, through your Holy Spirit, would you show them, open up their eyes and their hearts to your great and glorious love. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's kids said, amen. Please stand. O oh, my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Testify against me. I brought you forth from the land of bondage and led you through the waters of salvation. And you have prepared a cross 
for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. I led you through the desert 40 years and fed you with the bread of heaven. I brought you into the land of promise, and you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. What could I have done for you that I have not done? I planted you, my vineyard, to bear sweet fruit, but you have become very bitter to me and gave me vinegar for my thirst. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. I opened the rock and gave you to drink from the water of life, and you have opened my side with a spear. I raised you on high with great power, and you have hanged me high upon the cross. O oh, my church, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Testify against me. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. You may be seated. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. You may remain seated for the gospel reading. When we get to the point in the reading where the place of the skull or Golgotha is mentioned, please stand. The Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ According to John. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they slapped him in the face. Once more Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look! I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jewish leaders insisted, 
we have a law, and according to that law, he must die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? He asked Jesus, but Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said. Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free. But the Jewish leaders kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the stone pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, Take, Take him away! Take him away! Crucify him! Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his, cl his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment gar remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened so that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, They divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife, wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now it was the day of preparation, and the next day 
was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those on the, of the other. But when they came to Jesus, they found that he was already dead. They did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of water and blood. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you may also believe. These things happen so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. Let us pray. Jesus, when we come to this night, we know that nothing we could ever say would be sufficient. So I ask that you would fill these words by your Holy Spirit, that they might be your word to your people, that I and all who hear them may see you with eyes of faith more deeply and more clearly and may receive your love for us. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Do you trust God when he says, I love you? Do you believe him when he says, I cherish you? If we're honest, we'd probably say, it depends. When everything is going well, it's easy to believe that heaven is smiling down on us. But when everything is falling apart, when nothing seems to be going right, it gets much, much harder. Because how can a God who loves me allow these things to happen to me, allow me to be stuck in this place? How can he not intervene? How can he not step in? How can he love me and not do something about it? But friend, what exactly is it that you'd like him to do? Because if he gave you that relationship back, you would have the same problems you had before. If he got that person out of the way, someone else would just get on your nerves. If he restored your health, it would just fall apart later. If he recovered your 401k, you would still want more. If he wiped out COVID-19 right in its tracks today, we would be afraid of it coming back. If we could all come out of our houses, we'd just be discontent with the pace of life that we had before. If even physical death were done away with, we wouldn't want to live that long in a broken world. You see, all these things are merely the symptoms. Because our disease, the greatest problem we face is not any of these things. Our fundamental disease is that we do not trust that God actually loves us. That distrust is not the result of all the problems we have. It is also the source. We see this in the biblical story. Adam and Eve's original sin is that they don't believe God really, truly wants their best. That he actually cares for them and so they can trust him. They refuse to trust him. And every other brokenness flows out of that one. Creation breaks and thorns and thistles like viruses emerge. Relationships break and we turn against one another. 
life breaks because death is now our destiny. We have refused to receive life from the source of all life. All those are downstream from our inability to trust God. And this is not just religious talk. It's not just insider language. There is nothing more practically valuable than believing that the God of the cosmos treasures you. Because if we really believe that in our bones, we don't have to fear a broken creation and viruses because we know the creator delights in us and he will make that creation and us new again. We don't have to despair or fight back when others hurt us because we know our value and our worth and they are secure and they are not threatened by them. We don't even have to fear death because we know that he has promised a life beyond death, a life through death, which enables us to serve others even when it's uncomfortable. Knowing that the king of all creation loves us makes us truly free. Free to walk even through suffering with a soul at peace because we know he is for us and that he will make it right. But we don't. We don't trust God. Our natural posture, the disease we carry within us is that we trust no one but ourselves. We rely on nothing beyond what we can see on the horizon. We deny anything beyond what we can feel. And we cannot just make that change. We cannot force ourselves to delight independence. We can't make ourselves feel loved. See, we are trapped in this self-enforced isolation from our Father, and it's not for our good or anyone else's good. Which is why God himself broke in. The Son of God, by the plan of the Father and the power of the Spirit, became one of us. And as his life progressed, he continued to press in deeper and deeper to the consequences of our mistrust, into all the pain and the despair and the heartache, into a, into a childhood with parents who just didn't understand him, into his temptation in the desert in the opposition from the religious leaders, in the dread of the cross, even as he knew he had to go there and it approached, even in the sense of separation from his heavenly father on the cross. He came all the way into all the things that make us doubt the goodness of our father. And at every step, he trusted him. He showed us how it was meant to be and could be again. At every step, he cast himself on the Father's love throughout the Gospels. He cannot stop gushing about the goodness of his Abba, about his dependence on his care and protection, about how he's content to simply do what God tells him to do. And as the road gets harder, that trust gets carved out deeper through temptation and opposition and disappointment, even through the fear of what was coming. If it be possible, take this cup from me. He never stops trusting in his Father. But not my will, but your will be done. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Into your hands I commend my spirit. Even in the cry of desperation, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The Father is still my God, my God. I do not have that within me. I remember, remember a, a, a painful conversation. Somebody says a, a, a slightly harsh word to me. I stub my toe. And I wonder if any of this means anything. But at that final moment, when Jesus cries, it is finished. Our journey of distrust and his journey of trusting in the Father fully collide. His pursuit runs into our resistance. His faith merges into our faithlessness. His life comes into our death. His wholeness into our disease. And they kiss. 
And in that deadly kiss, everything is exchanged. The contagion and the cure are shared. And his faithfulness becomes our inheritance. And our mistrust becomes his wound. Theologians use the term substitutionary atonement to describe what happens in these moments. This, this idea that he took what we had wrought and we received what he had built. But this cannot just stay a theologian's term. This is a flaming beacon of passionate love. Because every act of love is actually a substitutionary sacrifice. That is what love is, a laying down of our lives for another. It is pressing into pain for the sake of another's flourishing. Love is what makes soldiers step in front of the bullets. Love is what makes mothers lose sleep at night. Love is what makes my kids' teachers cruise our neighborhood on their time off, hoping to see them in their front yards. Love is what makes a father sacrifice his dignity for the sake of his rebellious son. No, this cross is not some sad, unfortunate, messy, inelegant solution to this problem of God's holiness and God's love meeting our sin. It, this, is, this is the Son casting himself into the void, the Father offering his beloved to make more beloveds, the Spirit vacating the human body of the Son whom he had known for all eternity. All in a reckless rescue mission meant to prove that they will do anything to get us back. Isaiah, hundreds of years before, laid bare this mystery. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Friends, this night is the night where God says, I love you. Do you trust him? If all you are judging by is your pain, your suffering, your struggles, look to his pain, his suffering, his struggles, because whatever you are in, he came into. And if all you feel like you can muster is a weak and wavering acceptance, then look at the son's dogged, relentless confidence in his father's love. Because that is now yours. There is nothing that you have lost that he did not lose. And nothing he gained that you are not privy to. It is all his gift for you to receive. His faithfulness is now your faith. His prayer is your prayer. His Abba is your Abba. His belovedness is your belovedness. The Father's delight in Him is the Father's delight in you. If I could reach through the computer screen and shake you so that you know how much God loves you, I would. But I can't. Because it is the Spirit, God himself, who pours his love into our hearts. So that is why as we come to this night, all we can do is pray together. Holy Spirit, we are not worthy of these things. We cannot comprehend these things. We cannot grasp the depths of this love and the horrors of what our mistrust has wrought on our own. So we ask you, Spirit, to reveal your truth to us. We ask you to pour your love into our hearts 
so that this night might not be an academic exercise or an intellectual puzzle or even just something to fear, but that in our hearts and souls it may be a truly good Friday. We ask for you to come and do what only you can do. To reveal the glory shown in this weakness. The beauty that emerges from the horror of this cross. May you plant in us the faith of the Son that we are loved. Amen. Please stand for the solemn collects. Dear people of God, our Heavenly Father sent His Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved, that all who believe in Him might be delivered from the power of sin and death, and become heirs with Him of everlasting life. We pray, therefore, for people everywhere according to their needs. Let us pray for the Holy Church throughout the world, that the Lord our God may preserve her in unity, peace, and safety, bringing into divine subjection all powers and principalities, and that he might grant, to grant us to dwell in such peace and tranquility that we may show forth the glory of God. Almighty God, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. Fill it with all truth, in all truth with all peace. Where it is corrupt, purify it. Where it is in error, direct it. Where in anything it is amiss, reform it. Where it is right, strengthen it. Where it is in want, provide for it. Where it is divided, reunite it. For the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. Amen. Let us pray for all those in civil authority, in every nation of the world, that they knowing whose ministers they are, may above all things seek God's honor and glory. Almighty God, whose kingdom is everlasting and whose power is infinite, we commend our nations to your merciful care, that being guided by your providence, we may dwell secure in your peace. Grant to all in authority wisdom and strength to know and to do your will. Fill them with the love of truth and righteousness and make them ever mindful of their calling to serve their people in your fear. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray to God, the Father Almighty, that he would cleanse the world from all evil, deliver it from pestilence and famine, set free those who are in captivity, restore the sick to health, and bring those who travel to a haven of safety.
gracious God, the comfort of all who sorrow, the strength of all who suffer. Let the cry of those in misery and need come to you, that they may find your mercy present with them in all their afflictions. And give us, we pray, the strength to serve them for the sake of him who suffered for us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all those who do not believe in Christ, that the Holy Spirit may enlighten them through his word and bring them to salvation and assurance of eternal life. Merciful God, creator of all the peoples of the earth and lover of souls, have compassion on all who do not know you as you are revealed in your Son, Jesus Christ. Let your gospel be preached with grace and power to those who have not heard it. Turn the hearts of those who resist it and bring home to your fold those who have gone astray that there may be one flock under one shepherd, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us commit ourselves to our God and pray for the grace of a holy life, that with all who have died in the peace of Christ and those whose faith is known to God alone, we may be accounted worthy to enter into the fullness of the joy of our Lord and receive the crown of life in the day of resurrection. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery by the working of your providence, carry out the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things were cast down are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him. Through him all things were made. Your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. We are embodied people. And sometimes it helps us to remember, helps to drive truths deeper into our being when we, we have a tangible sign, a tangible symbol of them. In that spirit, we are now coming to the time of binding our sins to the cross as a reminder that they are there and they have been left there, that this great exchange out of love has happened. Tonight, I want to encourage us to think about these things, these sins, not in terms of the list of sins, which we typically might, but to think about the places where we wrestle with trusting God. To think about the places in our lives where we are tempted to grab onto our own sense of what is right and good, and we struggle to release into his fatherly care. We encourage you to write those things on sheets of paper which are either provided for you in the worship packet or which you may have at home and then to bind them to the piece of wood either that was given to you um, or um, that, that you have at home by nails or something else we're going to give a few minutes for reflection a few minutes to enter into this ask the spirit to sift your heart to show you the places that he's inviting you to trust him with on this Good Friday. Behold the wood of the cross on which was hung the world's salvation. O oh, come, let us adore him. Behold the wood of the cross on which was hung the world's salvation. O oh, come, let us adore him. 
Behold the wood of the cross on which was hung the world's salvation. O come, let us adore him.
please stand. Let's pray together the prayer that Jesus taught. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Please kneel. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, we pray you to set your passion, cross, and death between your judgment and our souls. Now, and in the hour of our death. Give to us sinners everlasting life and glory for your mercy's sake. For the Father and the Holy Spirit, you live and reign, one God, now and forever. Amen. Mm -hmm. 